So today we're going to uh, wrap up our series um, on the book of Esther. And um, to get us started, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, um, this idea of comebacks from the perspective of sports. And I get it. Not everybody is an athlete or not everybody is into uh, to, to sports. But um, generally speaking, a lot of culture is. And while you may not be um, fully invested uh, in that, uh, you certainly, most likely, most people uh, like the idea or value the idea of a comeback, of somebody who's losing, um, and somehow there's this great reversal, and the, and, and the game changes. So there have been, in the past eight years, several um, historical comebacks in major sports. Uh, so you can take, for example, in 2016, the uh, Chicago Cubs. The Chicago Cubs uh, come back from a three to one deficit. It's just like all end is lost. There's a sense in which all end is lost. They're not, they're not going to be able to recover from this. They're, they're losing to the Cleveland Indians, who are now the Cleveland Guardians, uh, three games to one. And, but somehow, somehow they find a way to come back and they win the next three games and they win the World Series. Uh, similarly, that same year, 2016, we found uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers doing the same thing. They were down three games to one uh, to uh, Steph Curry's uh, Golden State Warriors. The Golden State Warriors in 2015, that, that, that NBA season, set an NBA record with 73 wins and only nine losses. And they are up at this point in in the uh, NBA Finals, they're up three games to one, but LeBron James leads the Cavs back. This improbable comeback. And there's several moments in several of those games, it's like, it's over with. But no, somehow they find a way, they reverse course, and they win. Crazy, crazy comeback. Exciting, exciting time if you're an NBA fan. Um, and then you can think of 2017, uh, pro probably a lot of people remember this because a lot of people do watch the Super Bowl, but in 2017, this was the uh, New England Patriots who were down 28-3 to in the third quarter and somehow found a way to come back and, and make this improbable tie against the Atlanta Falcons uh, just about as time expires. And then the game goes into overtime and uh, the Patriots... Uh, uh, win in overtime, setting two Super Bowl records, uh, the, the biggest comeback ever, and then um, a, a win in overtime. They, they reverse the, the course of the, of the game. It's just this complete reversal. Now, my favorite comeback, my favorite comeback of all sports is the Buffalo Bills, 1993, January 3rd, comeback, the biggest uh, NFL playoff comeback of all times. They are out of it, 35 to 3. Right, Henry? Right, Kathy? Right, right, right. Big, that's it. Game's over, done. I can remember watching it on a little 10 inch, I'm a Bills fan in case you didn't know, um, a little 10 inch TV, watching the game all by myself and my, my wife's family, and they're all downstairs doing whatever. And, and I'm, watching, I'm watching this game, it's like, oh, play after play, it's just like, it's over with, it's over with. And somehow they miraculously come back and they win in overtime. 41 um, to 38, and, and, and what a crazy, crazy game. And some people, right, Henry and Kathy, watch that game, the beginning of every NFL season, in hopes that the Bills will somehow pull that off, right, and win the Super Bowl, of which we never have done, but there's hope, maybe this year, maybe this year. Great reversals, right? Um, comebacks, these comebacks. Uh, there's something that connects to uh, our hearts connect with when we watch these things. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps there's, there's something going on inside of us as people as to why we connect with that. Perhaps it's because we recognize that as people, life is really challenging. It's really hard. And for most of us, the reality is our life is going in one direction, the wrong direction, a direction that we don't want it to go. There's something in, in my life that's going in that direction. And, and, and the hope the dream of having a comeback, of, of reversing that, of seeing my life go in the other direction, just seems like it seems impossible, but it is the hope that we have. And so we watch these 
activities, these, these sporting events, and we, we somehow perhaps think, could it be possible with, could this happen with my kid? With my kid who has cut me off and has just left and is going his or her own way and does not want to have a relationship with, with me, his, his parent, anymore. And, and it's been going on for year after year. And I know, people, I, I know families, I know moms and dads who are in this place. And it's like, can there ever be a reversal? Well, is it possible that my kid's heart, my son's heart, my daughter's heart would change and, and he or she would turn and would return? Or so, perhaps some of us have that feeling towards our spouse. So, would, is it possible for him or for her to change? I mean, our, our relationship is going like this and it's going like this and it's going further and further apart. We're going further and further away from each other and it just seems hopeless for various reasons, it just seems hopeless. And can it change? And, and you pray that it would change. You pray that he or she would, 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 would change. And you just have this hope. Maybe, just maybe, something will change and the course will be reversed. And on and on, we can go through examples in life of, you know, um, in, in our, our jobs and, and, and the work culture in which we work in, or maybe our, our company's losing work and we, we, we see the handwriting on the wall and if they don't find any work, uh, we're going to get let go. Or, or it's just on and on. There's all kinds of ways in life in which life is going in a way in which we're losing. I have habits in my life that are taking me in a losing path. And if I could just stop it and, and turn around... It would, be, it would be wonderful. It'd be, it's just great hope. Great hope. Now we read uh, to this morning, um, Tim read for us very effectively about the Advent candle hope and um, its connection to um, the prophecies. And, and in, in, in Jesus Christ, we'd find great hope. There would be a reversal, a reversal the way things are going. If you were there this morning, if you can identify with any of this morning, then the ending of our series will definitely connect with your heart. Because Esther, and we're going to look at the end of Esther 8, 9, and 10, really kind of quickly. We're going to read through all of this. But in, in, as we come to the conclusion of our series through the book of Esther, the God who is hidden, can't see him, his name is not mentioned, and yet he's present. We see him reversing things over and over and over again in the story. Um, I, hope, I hope that today, as we read 8, 9, and 10, you will, you will experience the hope, the hope that, that Esther and the nation experienced in this reversal. And so there's two words um, for, for us today. Last week I gave us two words, right? Do you remember those two words? Two words were prudence, Esther's prudence and presence, God's presence that led to Haman getting trapped in his own trap. We ended last week with Haman um, being hung on the gallows that he had built uh, to, 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 to eliminate Mordecai. And the two words for today are two R words. So last week it was two P words, today is two R words. The first one is reversal. And the second one is remembrance. We spend most of our time on reversal and we'll wrap up on remembrance. There's a lot of text to read and to reflect on. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to try to read, the, read the, 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 the text in a way that um, is um, in, interesting and engaging. But as I read through, we're going to start in chapter 8. So we end in chapter 7. Haman is hung on the gallows. Um, we're going to start in chapter 8. As I read through 8, I'm going to skip a, a few verses here and there. As I read through chapter 8 and into chapter 9, pay attention for the reversals. Watch for them. Actually, I've kind of already given you clues if you're reading on the side screen because I've highlighted several of them. So here we go. Mordecai is spared. Haman's hanging on the gallows. That same day, verse 1 of chapter 8, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Wow, isn't that crazy? And Mordecai came into the presence of the king. So this is a new bit of information. The king didn't know who Mordecai was, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, right? So the king had given to Haman 
his signet ring. He made Haman second in command. Now it's Mordecai. He gives it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Then Esther again pleaded with the king. This is the very same scenario that we found um, playing out uh, over the prior couple of days in, in her life. She pleads with the king, falling at his feet and weeping, and she begs him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. And then, just like we saw in chapter uh, 5, the king extends the gold scepter to Esther. He extends it to her, and she rises, and she stands before him. And then, and then this common phrase that we heard over and over, if it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor, and if he thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised. There's a great reversal. And wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to, de- to, to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? So King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther, and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews. I've given his estate to Esther, and they've hanged him on his gallows. Now, now the king does, so here we're going to do a new decree. This is a reversal of the previous one. And the king's name, in behalf of the Jews, it seems best to you, seal it with the king's signet ring. That, that, that's the exact opposite. For, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be, un- or can, can be revoked. So he made, a, he made this edict. He can't un- undo the edict that, that, that Haman convinced him to, to make, and he sealed it with his ring, and now, now write a new one, he says. So the king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or providence that might attack them and their women and their children and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the province of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. Remember, remember it was Haman who rolled the dice, and the dice landed, landed on the 12th month, the 13th day of the 12th month, and so that was the day that they had established And so now this new edict is being written and it gives them about nine months to prepare, to to, to get ready as Jews, to get ready to defend themselves from enemies who are going to come and kill them. Because remember, the king's edict still is in place. Anybody who wants to kill the Jews can kill the Jews. But now he writes a new edict and says, you Jews, you can defend yourself. So verse 13, a copy of this text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves of their enemies. And so the couriers, riding royal horses, horses, raced out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. Now here comes a significant reversal. As we flip over to chapter 9, verse 1, on the 13th day, So now we fast forward. It's nine months later. This is the day of reckoning. Who's going to win this battle? On the 13th day of the 12th month of the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. And on this day, on this day, it was on this day that the Jews had, had what? Had hoped to, or the enemies of the Jews had what? They had hoped to overpower them. But now, look at this interesting little phrase. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. That phrase, the tables were turned, that's an English idiom, right? That's the way we talk in English. And so the translators, when they're reading the Hebrew and translating into English and wanting to translate into modern um, language, they take, they take the two Hebrew words. And here's the two Hebrew words. The first one means an absolute, total, emphatic, turn back. Right? Go in this direction, bonk, stop, absolute, total, absolute, reversal, turn back. The second phrase is to gain the upper hand. And so they were going this way, they were going this way, they were going to be destroyed and annihilated, but on this day, on this day, absolute, total reversal, they gain the upper hand and things go the opposite direction. The ESV, I put the ESV up here, which 
um, gives an, a, a different English translation. When the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. There's our word, reverse. The reverse occurred, and the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Now, how did that happen? We don't yet know as we're reading through the story. But, but, but why? How, how were they able to, this little old group of people, able to defend themselves? What, what was happening? behind the scenes. The next verse tells us. Verse 2, chapter 9. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of kings and Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. So just pause for a second um, so we understand this. It's not like the Jews were going out to fight people just because they wanted to kill all Persians or kill everybody in the nation. No, that's not what's going on here. The Jews under the edict, are given the permission by the king to defend themselves from their enemies who want to come and destroy and kill them. So the king enables them basically to fight back to defend themselves. So it's not like sometimes people get, get a little confused and go, these people are warmongering and no, 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 that's not what's happening. The verse goes on and says this, no one, how is it that they were able to reverse things? No one could stand against them. Why? Because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. Well, that's interesting. Keep reading. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, the king's administrators, that's three sets of different kinds of leaders. It's the top leader, the next down leader, and the next down leader. It's like um, the uh, prime minister, the uh, the governor of, uh, of, of, of the state, and then local officials. These governing leaders within the kingdom, what, what happened? What do they do? They help the Jews. <laughs> so now all of the king's men, his significant men, are helping the Jews. Now remember, all the king's men, they're Persians. They're helping the Jews. And what, what, what does it say here? Why? Why are they helping the Jews? Because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai had become prominent in the palace. His reputation had spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. So this is, very, this is a very interesting little bit of um, uh, info that the author gives to us as to how it was that everything were going this way. This was the moment, the defining moment when LeBron, you know, pulled down the, the rebound and went running down the court and slam dunked. And it was just like every, the whole thing just changed. The game reversed. This is that moment. And it's, it is fear. It is an unexplained Fear that eases, it oozes in to people's hearts all across the country. So they're going to bed at night and, and, and they're hearing, okay, so this battle is coming, but, 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 but the Jews are they're on God's side. God's on their side. And how can we ever defeat them? And, and, and all the governing officials, they're helping. How can we ever defeat them? And, and so the enemies... The enemies are fearful. Flipping the page to verse 5, the Jews attack and they strike down all of their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they, they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500. So there were 500 men. And then a big long list, that the, 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 all those guys are the 10 sons of Haman who later we find are actually get hung um, as well, along with, with their father who was hung. Uh, but, but they did not lay hands on their plunder. That's an interesting little phrase. They were, they were able to take all, all the, the treasure, but they didn't. The Jews did not take the treasure. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's province also assembled to, to protect themselves. This is like all around the whole empire. Remember the empire from Cush? You know, all, all this big, big, huge, massive empire. So Jews all over the empire assembled. They were able to defend themselves, protect themselves, and get relief from their enemies. And they killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay hands. There, is a, there it is again on that, on that phrase. The, lay, lay their hands on the plunder. So if you just to pause and, and, and kind of think for a second here, the numbers of reversals. There's all kinds of reversals in this story. I mean, the Jews hope 
If we, if we go back to the, to the beginning of the story in, in chapter 3, when the edict came down, that Haman convinced the king, and, and they, they, they sent the edict all throughout the, 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 the empire, the, the next phrase is that the Jews were weeping, and they put ashes on their head, and they laid in ash uh, um, in, in, in sackcloth, and, and it was impending doom. They're going to die. They're going to be annihilated as a nation. And this, this, is the, this is the place that they're at. This is where their life is. They're going in this direction, this losing direction. Everything is lost. And maybe that's exactly where you're at this morning. You're, you're in this place in which it just seems like it's impossible, absolutely impossible, that I can't see any way it's impossible to see any way for my situation or my circumstance to change. That is exactly where the Jews were. Exactly where they were. And so they laid down and they wept and they cried and they grieved and they had no hope. They just had grief. And then you, you may be there this morning. You may be there this morning. And if that's where you are, that's where you are. You're just, you're in chapter two of the story. You're in chapter three of the story. This is where you're at. You're just there. But, but perhaps be encouraged. This is no promise, right? But, but perhaps, but perhaps there may be a great reversal for you, the same kind of reversal that the Jews experienced. And, and you may experience and you may find hope. You see, the, the book of Esther really is the story of stories of great reversals. So as I was thinking about this throughout the, the, the past week, I just kind of began with like chapter one, um, and the king, who had no favor for Queen Vashti, right? He, he just got rid of Queen Vashti. But every time that Esther is mentioned in the story, the king always finds favor with her. It's just such a reversal, such an opposite, uh, an unexpected. Why does the king have favor towards Esther? He just does. He, he continuously shows favor to Esther. If you go to chapter 3, we, we, we find Haman, and we're introduced to him as this evil character, right? And he hates Mordecai, and he wants to destroy him. But then there's this great reversal in chapter 6 in which Haman is ordered to ride uh, Mordecai through the city and, and offer praise and honor. I mean, what? A, you, go, you hate somebody, but you're forced to praise them. What a great reversal. Chapter 5, Haman builds his gallows, right, for Mordecai. Chapter 7, Haman gets hung on those very gallows. Just a great reversal. Chapter 3, Haman um, makes, um, um, is made second in command. He's given the king's signet ring. But then in chapter 8, Mordecai is, takes that place. And he's given the pr position of prominent and, and, and the signet ring. In chapter 3, there's this edict to annihilate the Jews, right? But then in chapter 8, we find this edict. No, you, the Jews can defend themselves. And then in chapter 3, we, we, we find that the 13th is the day to annihilate the Jews, uh, the 13th of, of the 12th month. But in chapter 9, we find that the 13th day of the 12th month, that what ha actually happens is that the Jews defeat their enemies. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing story of stories of great reversals. And so I, I, I write this then in my notes. Um, the story of Esther, story of Esther, next slide, is, is this. It's, it's, the, it's the, the hidden God. It's the story of the hidden God who is a present God working behind the scenes, right? We said this in the very first week. He's the hidden God working behind the scenes in unexpected ways to bring about great reversals. And this is what God does. We can't see him. We don't know how he's doing it, but he's working. He's working in, 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 in this story of stories of this great reversal can be a source of hope to us. If God did it then, maybe he'll do it now. If he did it in chapter three, maybe he'll do it in chapter five. If he did it in chapter three, maybe he'll do it in chapter eight. If he, if he did it in Esther's life, maybe he'll do it in my circumstance, in my situation, in my life. This is who God is. He's a God of great reversals. That's the R. The second R is to remember. So the story, it's like, you know, there really is the end of the story. We got to the end of the story, but the, but the, the narrator and Mordecai didn't want the story to end there. He wanted the story to be remembered, permanently drilled in the minds of 
the Jews forever moving forward. And so this is what happens. Verse 17 of chapter 9, he says this. Or the narrator says, this happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of fasting, or a day of feasting and of great joy. A little bit like Thanksgiving. Uh, the Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. This is why rural Jews, those living in the villages, observe the 14th in the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day of giving presents to each other. They give presents to each other. Now, now look what happens next. Mordecai recorded these events. He sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them what, to, to, to do what? To remember, to celebrate annually the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews could gain relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. So he wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Very fascinating. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration that they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. Therefore, jumping down to verse 26, these days were called Purim, from the word pur, which means the lot or rolling of the dice, to remind them. So we're going to have this celebration called Purim. We're going to have this celebration called Advent. We're going to have this celebration called Christmas. Because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and had, and had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. And so these days down to verse 28, these days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family in every providence in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. This is a fascinating end. And you know what? <laughs> the nation of Israel, Jews, celebrate Purim to this day. So here's some slides, uh, some, some images that I grabbed from uh, just the re most recent one. So the uh, calendar year for the Jew is different than our Gregorian calendar year. So our January is the first of the year, right? Um, and our December is the 12th month of the year. Well, for the Jews, uh, their calendar, it's March is the first, or is the, March, I'm sorry, is the 12th month of the year. So that's the end. So, so back around, typically when we celebrate Easter, Easter comes in March or April, generally more like April, but um, around that time of the year, that's when the Jews celebrate. And, and it is a, it's like, a, it's like Mardi Gras, uh, a big parade, lots of alcohol, costumes, everybody dresses up. It's, it's a big, it's big parades, just a big, huge celebration. You don't have to be a Jew to participate. Lots of people from different nationalities who are in Israel at the time will, will come and, and just party and have fun and celebrate. And remember that there is a story of a woman called Esther and how God, through supernaturally, this hidden God but present God, worked great reversals through their nation through their story, and delivered them miraculously. And so they celebrate it to this day. As I close, just a, a couple, couple comments about uh, remembrance and why that's so significant. It's, it's so important for us to remember things, right? Why? Because we forget. We forget. You forget. I forget. We forget. We constantly forget. One of the things that we find in Scripture is over and over these instructions to remember, to remember, to remember, to celebrate. So it's interesting, if you do read the Old Testament, and particularly in the book of Leviticus, there's this big long list of feasts. There's seven feasts that the Jews are to um, remember and celebrate throughout a calendar year. Seven week-long vacations. Seven, seven week-long let's get together and have big parties and remember how God supernaturally intervened in our time in this point in our nation's history and created a great reversal. One of those that we, we hear the most about as, as uh, Christians 
is Sab or not uh, is um, the Passover, and we we, t- we typically talk about the Passover in connection with Easter. But, but the Passover is one of those seven feasts which reminds the nation of Israel that God had miraculously delivered them from Egypt, right? And they put blood on the doorpost and the Passover angel passed over them. But seven feasts, the Passover being a really significant one, seven feasts established to remind the nation of God's great reversals. But, but throughout the Old Testament, we find other God, instructions where God says, do this in remembrance, do this to remember, do this to, 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 to keep in the forefront of your mind things like the Sabbath. So in Exodus 20, in his Ten Commandments, he instructs the, the nation, do this, do this, love me, honor me, do this towards other people. And then, and then he says this, I work for six days and on the seventh day I rested. So... I'm putting together the world in such a way that it works so that there's seven days in a week and on the seventh day, take a break, rest. I did it, you do it. It's, a, it's an instruction that God gives to us. And if you don't practice the Sabbath, you're, 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 you're missing something. God instructs us to rest. We're not machines. We need to take a break. He, 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 t- he tells us to do that. It's to remind us of who he is and that he can take care of all of our needs and that we need to rest. Um, there's other, other things, like uh, as I was thinking through like how God gives us these things to remind us, uh, my mind went to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and this instruction about um, parents teaching your kids every day when they wake up and, and while you're living life and while you're walking along the road to life, teach, teach your kids who I am. Teach them all about me to, and teach them to love me with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then in that text, there's these little things that, that Moses gives to the nation. He says, um, uh, you should write these things down, these instructions down, and put them in a box on your head and strap it around your head and, and carry them there and write them on your hands and put them around your hands to, to keep them in and, and, and write them on the door frames of your house so that you can remember because you quickly forget and, and you need to remember my words. So I, I think of my, uh, one of my sons in particular who, who has all of these little bracelets that, that he wears. And he, uh, so he's a football player at Grove City College and there's one that says their vision on it and it's always there and all the, 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 the team, they all wear these things to keep it in front of them all of the time. And, and he has a few other th- memories, right? And, and so you know what those little rubber band things are and how we, how we do that, right? Or, or a plaque and you stick it, you, you write a verse down, you stick it in the wall so it's there, so you see it. You remind yourself of these spiritual truths because you forget them and you need to be reminded and we need to be reminded. Or uh, another thing, uh, let's just talk a little bit about like in connection with this, like habits, the habit of reading the Bible daily. I was like, oh man, that's hard to do. Like, I don't understand the Bible. I know, I get it. I hear, I hear you guys. I, I interact with you. I, I understand. <laughs> but, but the truth is, is that the daily habit of reading the Bible, just the daily habit of reading the Bible is so helpful because it gives you what you need for that moment in that day. Um, I find myself, you know, I've been reading through Proverbs and, and I, and I think, get through, I'm like, yesterday I remember this one proverb and that was really significant. What was that? Like, I remember God really challenged me with that. Like, I remember it was a little bit, but I got to go back over there and like, I can read it again. Like, oh yeah, that, I wish I could like remember that. Like, get it stamped in my head. Like, and like that verse over there. And like, man, if I could only get it there all the time. But it like leaks out and I, and I forget. So this is where the daily habit, right, of doing it daily of just reading God's word daily is, is really a helpful habit. Or spending time in solitude and silence and, and prayer, having this daily, regular habit in my life because I need that space, right? The Sabbath, I need that space. Gathering for worship on, on Sundays, like, I get it. Sometimes you don't like the music and sometimes the message is just kind of whatever and kind of boring and doesn't hit me where I'm at or not very interesting or, or whatever. I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm there with you. I know. But the, day, or the, the, the regular weekly gathering together, 
There's something significant about that. Don't, as uh, the, the writer in, in Hebrew says, don't forsake the regular assembling of yourselves together because there's something that happens through the habit, just the habit, just of doing it. I can't tell you how many times I find myself on a Sunday morning saying, I'm so glad I made the choice. I mean, it is my job, but, but I'm so glad I made the choice to be here because I need to be here. I need, and I need these guys up here leading me and the words up there. I'm like, I need that. I need to be reminded of that. I need to be kicked in the, you know, and to, to be reminded you, you need to change some things and, and you need to be uplifted and encouraged and, and you need to like open your arms and look up and give thanks to God, right? And I, I need this. You need this. We need this. So that's why God tells us, do this, do this, do this, right? Remember, because we always forget. We forget. So we have other practices like, like baptism and communion, right? And then times of celebrating like Easter and Christmas where we celebrate significant events. Why? To remember. <laughs> Mordecai went to great lengths. <laughs> you saw that in the text. It's like over and over and over emphasized. You know, Practice this. Practice this. Don't, stop. Don't, 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 don't miss this. Do this. Do this. Every year, do this. Make sure you do this. We need, we, need, we, need to, we need to do this because we forget. We need, we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded that God can do great reversals in our life. I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up. Music just came on. That's kind of cool. Maybe that was the clue that I was supposed to end. As they're coming, I want to end with um, a Christmas story. As it is the Christmas season, uh, Charles Dickens wrote The Christmas Carol. Remember the story of The Christmas Carol? It really is a story of great reversal at a time in which we pause and we celebrate that Jesus does great reversals. And so uh, as Charles Dickens begins his book and begins to, to, to describe and paint um, for us uh, as we read this image of who Scrooge is, he writes these words. He says, Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, ripped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stifled his gait, made his eyes red, but his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his office in the, in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Scrooge, this old sinner, this self-contained, selfish, grumpy, hard as flint individual. And then as the story goes, he meets the three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. And then he awakens after this dream in the middle of the night on Christmas morning. And he has a complete transformation as he wakens and realizes he's alive, right? And so this is how Dickens ends the story in telling us about Scrooge. He says, uh, this is what Scrooge said, a Merry Christmas to Bob, or his, his, his worker whom he didn't care very much for, said Scrooge with an earnest that, that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on, as, on his back. A Merry Christmas, Bob, my, my, my good fellow. 
than I have uh, given you for a merry, or for many years. I'll raise your salary. What? You're kidding me. You're Scrooge. And endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. What? Are you crazy? You're not that generous. Make up the fires. What? Put more fires on and, and buy another coal shuttle before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit. And then, and then look at how Dickens ends. He says, Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He, he became so good a friend, a good a master, and a good man, as the good old city knew, or any old good old city town or borough in the good old world. Scrooge was this guy living his life like this, but he had a reversal going like this. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas, right? We, we, we celebrate this reminder that we are, we're all Scrooges. All of us. We're, we're, we're stuck in sin, and, and sin is living in reverse of the way that God wants. Sin is going the wrong way. It's missing the mark. It's coming up short. It's, it's living in a way that's it's self-destructive, ultimately. That's what sin is. It's living in reverse. But at Christmas, what we celebrate is that God did a great reversal. He came into the world, right? And he took the wages of sin. The wages of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. It's separation. It wrecks everything. That's what sin does. It wrecks everything. But God does this great reversal coming into the world, taking upon himself your sin and my sin. He pays the penalty for the wages of sin is death. He pays the penalty of death. He steps in our place. Great reversal so that we can have a great reversal, so that Scrooge can have a great reversal. If you've never turned your heart over to Jesus, maybe you've heard this message many times, but you've never just said, I confess my sin, Jesus. I need you. Come into my life. I'm done. Please come. Please help me. I urge you. I urge you. That is the beginning of the great reversal in your life. Please stay in church and let's sing this final song.
have a great week. Next week, we start a new series. The title of it is Fear Not. Fear Not. We'll be looking at the Christmas story and that statement that the angel made. Fear Not, when he talked to Mary, to Joseph, and to the angels. Um, consider inviting somebody to, uh, to join you. Uh, it's Christmas, and sometimes people who are uh, not typically um, open to uh, uh, worship service or checking out God might be. So uh, be a little bit externally focused and think of inviting somebody uh, to, to, to participate in one of, the, one of the messages over the next series. All right, have a great week.